Hanna Lowen Hopsing. She's written this book, The Mushroom at the End of the World on the Possibility of Life in Capitalist Ruins. And it is such a book which I've never read. I mean, it's so different. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, metaphorically, she talks about this mushroom and she projects it to, it has an econ, economy, philosophy, physiology, ecology, you name it, the environment. Um, I'll just read something from the prologue and we'll see what it is. It's from the Princeton University Press. So read a little from the prologue. Terrors, of course, there are, and not just for me. The world's climate is going haywire. The industrial progress has proved much more deadly to earth, life on Earth than anyone imagined a century ago. The economy is no longer a source of growth or optimism. Any of our jobs could disappear with the next economic crisis. And it's not just that I might fear a spurt of new disasters. I find myself without the handrails of stories that tell where everyone is going in and also why. Precarity once seemed the fate of the less fortunate. Now it seems that all our lives are precarious. Even when for the moment our pockets are lined, in contrast to the mid-century, 20th century, when poets and philosophers of the global north felt caged by too much stability, now many of us, North and South, confront the condition of trouble without end. So she writes that this book tells of my travels with mushrooms to explore the indeterminacy and the conditions of precarity that is life without the promise of stability. I have read that when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, thousands of Siberians suddenly deprived of state guarantees ran to the woods to collect mushrooms. These are not the mushrooms I follow, but they make my point. The uncontrolled lives of mushrooms are a gift and a guide, she writes. When the controlled world we thought we had fails. While I can't off offer you mushrooms, I hope you will follow me to savor the autumn aroma. This is the smell of Matsutake, a group of aromatic wild mushrooms much valued in Japan. Matsutake is loved as a marker of the autumn season. The smell evokes sadness and the loss of summer's easy riches, but it also calls up the sharp intensity and heightened sensibilities of autumn. Such sensibilities will be needed for the end of global progresses early summer. The autumn aroma leads me into common life without guarantees. And then she says, this book is not a critique of the dreams of modernization and progress that offered a vision of stability in the 20th century. Many analysts before me have dissected those dreams. Instead, I address the imaginative challenge of living without those handrails which once made us think we knew collectively where we were going. If we open ourselves to their fungal attractions, Matsutake can catapult us into the curiosity that seems to me the first requirement of collaborative survival in precarious times. Here's how a radical pamphlet put the challenge. The specter that many try not to see is a simple realization. The world will not be saved. If we don't believe in a global revolutionary future, we must live as we, in fact, always had to in the present. And she talks about when Hiroshima was destroyed by an atomic bomb in 1945, it is said, the first living thing to emerge from the blasted landscape was a 
Matsutaki Mushroom Grasping the atom was a culmination of human dreams of controlling nature. It was also the beginning of those dreams undoing. The bomb at Hiroshima changed things. Suddenly, we became aware that the humans could destroy the livability of the planet, whether intentionally or otherwise. This awareness only increased as we learned about pollution, mass extinction, and climate change. One half of current precarity is the fate of the earth. What kind of human disturbances can we live with? Despite talk of sustainability, how much chance do we have for passing a habitable environment to our multi-species descendants? She writes, Hiroshima's bomb also opened the door to the other half of today's precarity, the surprising contradictions of post-war development. After the war, the promises of modernization backed by American bombs seemed bright. Everyone was to benefit. The direction of the future was well known, but is it now, she writes. On the one hand, no place in the world is untouched by the global political economy built from the post-war development apparatus. On the other, even the promises of development still beckon. We seem to have lost the means. Modernization was supposed to fill the world, both communist and capitalist, with jobs, and not just any jobs, but standard employment, with stable wages and benefits. Such jobs are now quite rare. Most people depend on much more irregular livelihoods. The irony of our times then is that everyone depends on capitalism, but our almost no one has what we call a regular job. She writes, We might look around to notice this strange new world and we might stretch our imagination to grasp its contours. This is where mushrooms help. Matsutaki's willingness to emerge in blasted landscapes allows us to explore the ruin, the ruin that has become our collective home. Matsutaki are wild mushrooms that live in human disturbed forests. Like rats, raccoons and cockroaches, they are willing to put up with some of the environmental messes humans have made. Yet they are not pests. They are valuable gourmet treats, at least in Japan, where high prices sometimes make Matsutake the most valuable mushroom on earth. Through their ability to nurture trees, Matsutake help forests grow in daunting places. To follow, Matsutake guides us to possibilities of coexistence with environmental disturbances. This is not an excuse for further damage. Still, Matsutaki show one kind of collaborative survival. Matsutaki also illuminate the cracks in the global political economy. For the past 30 years, Matsutaki have become a global commodity foraged in forests across the northern hemisphere and shipped fresh to Japan. Many Matsutaki foragers are displaced and disenfranchised cultural minorities. In the U.S. Pacific Northwest, for example, most commercial Matsutaki foragers are refugees from Laos and Cambodia. Because of high prices, Matsutaki makes a substantial contribution to livelihood wherever they are picked and even encourage cultural revitalizations. She further writes, Matsutake commerce, however, hardly leads to 20th century development dreams. Most of the mushroom foragers I spoke with have terrible stories to tell of displacement and loss. Commercial foraging is a better than usual way of getting by for those with no other way to make a living. But what kind of economy is this anyway? Mushroom foragers work for themselves. No companies hire them. There are no wages and no benefits. Pickers merely sell the mushrooms they find. Some years there are no mushrooms. The pickers are left with their expenses. Commercial wild mushroom picking is an exemplification of precarious livelihood without security.
Now she talks about the book. This book takes up the story of precarious livelihoods and precarious environments through tracking matsutake, commerce and ecology. In each case I find myself surrounded by patchiness that is a mosaic of open-ended assemblages of entangled ways of life and each further opening into a mosaic of temporal rhythms and spatial arcs. I argue that only an appreciation of current precarity as an earthwide condition allows us to notice this, the situation of our world. As long as authoritative analysis requires assumptions of growth, experts don't see the heterogeneity of space and time, even where it is obvious to ordinary participants and observers. Yet theories of heterogeneity are still in their infancy. See, brilliant, how brilliant she is. And she writes, To appreciate the patchy unpredictability associated with our current condition, we need to reopen our imaginations. The point of this book is to help that process along with mushrooms. And about commerce, she writes, Contemporary commerce works within the constraints and possibilities of capitalism. Yet, following in the footsteps of Marx, she writes, 20th century students of capitalism internalize progress to see only one powerful current at a time, ignoring the rest. Then again, she writes that this book shows how it is possible to study capitalism without its crippling assumption by combining close attention to the world in all its precarity with questions about how wealth is amassed. How might capitalism look without assuming progress? It might look patchy. The concentration of wealth is possible because value produced in unplanned patches is appropriated for capital. Then she writes about ecology for humanist assumptions of progressive human mastery have encouraged a view of nature as a romantic space of anti-modernity. Yet, for 20th century scientists, she writes, uh, progress also unselfconsciously framed the study of landscapes. Assumptions about expansion slipped into the formulation of population biology. New developments in ecology make it possible to think quite differently by introducing cross-species interactions and disturbance histories. In this time of diminished expectations, I look for disturbance-based ecologies in which many species sometimes live together without either harmony or conquest. Giving her insight further, she writes, While I refuse to reduce either economy or ecology to the other, there is one connection between economy and environment that seems important to introduce up front. The history of the human concentration of wealth through making both humans and non-humans into resources of investment. This history has inspired investors to imbue both people and things with alienation that is the ability to stand alone as if the entanglements of living did not matter. Through alienation, people and things become mobile assets. They can be removed from their life worlds in distance, de defying transport to be exchanged and other assets from other life worlds elsewhere. This is quite different from merely using others as part of a life world. For example, in eating and being eaten, in that case, multi-species living spaces remain in place. Alienation obviates living space entanglement. The dream of alienation inspires landscape modification in which one only one standalone asset matters. Everything else becomes wheat or waste. Here, attending to living space entanglement seems inefficient and perhaps archaic. When its singular asset can no longer be produced, a place can be abandoned. The timber has been cut, the oil has run out, 
the plantation soil no longer supports crops, the search for assets resumes elsewhere. Thus, simplification for alienation produces ruins, spaces of abandonment for asset production. Global landscapes today are strewn with this kind of ruin. Still, these places can be lively despite announcements of their death. Abandoned asset fields sometimes yield new, multi-species and multicultural life. In a global state of precarity, we don't have choices other than looking for life in this ruin. Our first step is to bring back curiosity, unencumbered by simplifications of progress narratives. The knots and pulses of Pachinus are there to explore. Matsutaki are a place to begin. However much I learn, they take me by surprise. She writes, well, this is not a book about Japan, but the reader needs to know something about Matsutaki in Japan to proceed. Matsutaki first appears in Japan's written record in the 8th century poem that starts this prologue. Already then, the mushroom is praised for its aromatic marking of the autumn season. The mushroom became common around Nara and Kyoto, where people had deforested the mountains for wood to build temples and to fuel iron for forges. Indeed, human disturbance allowed Prikloma Matsutaki to emerge in Japan. This is because its most common host is red pine, which germinates in the sunlight and mineral soils left by human deforestation. When forests in Japan are allowed to grow back without human disturbance, broadleaf trees shade our pines, preventing their further germination. A red pine spread with deforestation across Japan, Matsutaki became a valued gift presented beautifully in a box of ferns. Aristocrats were honored by it. By the Edo period, that is 1603 to 1868, well-to-do commoners such as urban merchants also enjoyed Matsutaki. The mushroom joined the celebration of the four seasons as a marker of autumn. Outings to pick Matsutaki in the fall were an equivalent of cherry blossom rioing parties in the spring. Matsutake became a popular subject for poetry. Akimi Tachibana wrote, The sound of a temple bell is heard in the cedar forest at dusk. The autumn aroma drips on the roads below. As in other Japanese nature poetry, seasonal reference helped build a mood. Matsutake joined older signs of the fall season, such as the sound of a deer crying or the harvest moon. The coming barrenness of winter touched autumn with an incipient loneliness at the edge of nostalgia. And the poem above offers that mood. Matsutake was an elite pleasure, a sign of the privilege to live within the artful reconstruction of nature for refined taste. For this reason, when peasants preparing for elite outing sometimes planted matsutake, that is, stuck mushrooms artfully in the ground because naturally occurring matsutake were not available, no one objected. Matsutake had become an element of an ideal seasonality appreciated not only in poetry but also in all the arts from tea ceremony to theatre. Another poem you may have. The moving cloud wades away and I smell the aroma of the mushroom by Koi Nagata. So I just go through that, go through the book about the author. She's a professor of anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a Niels Bohr professor at Aarhus University in Denmark. And um, she, her account of this sought after fungi offers insights into areas far beyond just mushrooms and 
addresses a crucial question, what managers to live in the ruins we have made? The mushroom of, at the end of the world follows one of the strangest commodity chains of our times to explore unexpected corners of capitalism. Here, we witness the varied and peculiar worlds of Matsutake commerce, the worlds of Japanese gourmet, capitalist traders, Hmong jungle fighters, Finnish nature guides, and more. These companions also lead us into fungal ecologies and forest histories to better understand the promise of cohabitation in a time of massive human destruction. The Mushroom at the End of the World is an original examination of the relationship between capitalist destruction and collaborative survival within multi-species landscapes, the prerequisite for continuing life on Earth. And um, uh, it's my, uh, in, in praise of the book, it's written, Sing, look here, weaves an adventurous tale, her engrossing account of interesting, intersecting, her engrossing account of intersecting cultures and nature's resilience offers a fresh perspective on modernity and progress, publishes weekly. And um, another review says, Kirkus review, star review, usually rewarding, bursting with ideas and observations, Zing's highly original anthographic study follows the spicy spelling mushrooms global commodity chain. Consistently fascinating, Zing's story of the picking and selling of this wild mushroom becomes a wonderful window on contemporary life. And Luiso Fresco writes that a fascinating account of the biology, ecology, genetics, and anthropology of the world's most valued mushroom. So it's a must read, and well, she's the winner of the 2016 Victor Turner Prize in ethnographic writing society for humanistic anthropology and winner of 2016 gregory bedison prize the society for cultural anthropology one of times higher education's best book of 2015. A must read book, The Mushroom at the End of the World. Go for it.